Hello and welcome to the afternoon session of the 2022 Florence Price Celebration at Day 2. Today we are hosted by Texas Lutheran University and we're going to get started with our student research symposium. Our first presenter is Jessica Danielle Martinez from Texas Lutheran University. Jessica Martinez graduated magna cum laude from Texas Lutheran University in December 2021 with a Bachelor's of Music in Music Education. While at Texas Lutheran University, Jessica served as principal bass clarinetist for the, U, uh, for the TLU Wind Ensemble and the vice president for the Delta Phi chapter of Tau Beta Sigma National Honorary Band Sorority. Her professional memberships include the Texas Music Educators Association and the International Clarinet Association. Jessica recently moved to Austin, Texas, and is currently substitute teaching in the surrounding Austin school districts. Her paper today is titled, The Life and Works of Florence Price, an Analysis of Symphony in E Minor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eichley. The great neo-expressionist artist Jean-Michel Basquiat once said, if art is how we decorate space, music is how we decorate time. Yet time is what has decayed the history of music. Societal and cultural influences affect the maintenance of music, especially by those that these norms seem undesirable. Compositions and composers alike are lost to the ether, but due to the wave of, of equality growing throughout our society, these works and people are beginning to resurface. Music by composers such as Margaret Bonds and Tanya Leon are finding their seat at the table. However, there were those that came before them. Despite racial tensions, Florence Price paved way for musicians of color by her ability to seamlessly blend African-American idioms with European traditions, thus creating a voice for a new generation of music. Florence Beatrice Price was born April 9, 1887 to a middle-class African-American family in Little Rock, Arkansas. Her father, James Smith, was a freedman and an established dentist in their town. It is unknown if Smith displayed or took interest in musical abilities, but he did write a novel and enjoyed painting. It is believed that Price's music abilities are largely indebted to her mother, Florence Irene, who first taught Price how to play piano. Florence Irene also came from a middle-class African-American family that supported the music arts. At a young age, she too learned how to play piano and would ultimately go on to become an elementary school music teacher. This love and understanding for piano and music would then transfer to her daughter, Florence Beatrice. Florence would show natural talent at the piano when at the age of four, she held her first public piano performance. With the guidance of her mother, Florence Price would also go on to show exceptional skills and composition by publishing her first compositional work at the age of 11. Three years later, Price would graduate high school as valedictorian at 14 years old and attend the New England Conservatory in Boston, Massachusetts. There, she would be the only double major in both piano and organ performance. However, getting into the conservatory was no small feat. Because of racial discrimination, Price's mother advised her to identify as Mexican in order to avoid any racism when applying for the conservatory. Florence B. Price's grandmother was at the time what people called a mulatto woman, meaning that she was a child born to a black slave mother and a white slave master, which caused for her descendants to be white passing. Despite these hardships, Price would prove to be a phenomenal composer. Before graduating in 1906, she had composed a symphony and a string trio, both which are lost to this day. After graduating from the conservatory, Price began her career as a piano professor at the Arkadelphia Academy and Shorter College. She did not spend much time at Arkadelphia Academy because in 1910, Price moved to Atlanta where she was the head of the music department at Clark University. Two years later, she would then move back to Arkansas to marry her husband, Thomas J. Price. 
She stayed in Arkansas to start a family, but still taught violin, piano, and organ lessons. Unfortunately, while teaching lessons, she was denied admissions into the Arkansas Music Teachers Association because she was African American. So, like many African Americans at this time, Florence Price picked up her life, left her husband, and moved to Chicago in what is known as the Great Migration. The Great Migration occurred between roughly 1916 and 1970. The catalyst was a string of racial aggressions and lynchings in the Deep South. Lynchings were rampant at this time with a shocking ratio of 17 to one of black lynching victims to white victims. Over the span of six decades, an estimated six million African-American people fled to the North to seek asylum from discrimination. Before the migration, 90% of African-Americans were living in the South, and by the time it was over, nearly 47% were now living in the North. Once they were settled, African-Americans would start to build their own societies that were free of the social, economic, and racial prejudice felt in the South. These societies would go on to birth what we know today as black urban culture. This culture would develop a new generation of innovators in fields that African-Americans were once forbidden from. One city that experienced a substantial amount of black excellence was Harlem, New York. When the Great Migration began, African Americans found themselves settling in larger cities in the North, which resulted in cities like Harlem having a significant African American community. From this culmination of great minds sprung the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance was a cultural revolution where African American artists of all mediums redefined what art was and what black art would be. In the process of development, author Alan Locke coined the term the New Negro Movement when he created a collection of noteworthy literary works by prominent black authors such as Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes. When this movement began, African American history had progressed two generations out of slavery. This generation was then using art as a way to help people gain broader civil and political rights. After moving to Chicago, Florence Price found herself in the middle of this movement and was exposed to the influence of other renowned black artists. The trend in music composed by black composers at this time was to incorporate idioms of their past, such as repetitive melodies, references to work songs, and the use of moving or dancing, to name a few. She would eventually feature these influences in her work, Symphony in E Minor. In 1932, Symphony in E Minor, along with her piano sonata in E Minor, won first place in the Wanamaker competition, which allowed the work to be premiered the following year at the Chicago World's Fair by the Chicago Symphony. This was a major step forward in the advancement of African American and women composers alike. Until roughly the 1930s, works by people of color were not performed, let alone chosen as the winner of a major composition competition. The black community felt this victory, and the journalist of the Chicago Defender, Robert S. Abbott, accounts this victory best in his statement, no one could have sat through that program and not felt with a sense of deep satisfaction that the race is making progress in music. First, there was a feeling of awe as the Chicago Symphony Orchestra swung into the beautiful harmonious strains of a composition of a race woman. The efforts from generations of black and white composers alike are what ultimately set the scene for Price's opportunity to shine. One of these noteworthy comp uh, composers being Antonin Dvorak. Dvorak was a Czech composer who was the director of the National Conservatory in New York during the turn of the century. He was a firm believer in that America needed to establish what its national sound is and believed that sound could be found in the folk songs of African and Native Americans. In his most acclaimed work, The New World Symphony, Dvorak incorporated elements of musical idioms from these folk songs to help establish this American sound. Price took inspiration from Symphony No. 9 and incorporated this inspiration into her own work. The most obvious similarity when looking at both scores is their titles. Symphony No. 9 from The New World suggests that it will be a programmatic piece, and so Price emulated this title in her own work. Price originally named her piece the New Negro Symphony, but prior to its performance, she destroyed the subtitle from the score. Scholars believe she did this because it would limit the perception of the symphony's scope. 
Another striking similarity between the two is the orchestration of solo material. When the Largo melody is played in Symphony No. 9, it is played by English horn over string accompaniment. Concurrently, Symphony in E minor, Movement 2, uses clarinet and English horn solos for the hymn passages over string accompaniment as well. Both composers were able to capture the spirit of the people and music they were trying to depict in symphonic form. The use of complex rhythms and spiritual representation emanate throughout both works to signify the character and personality of a people. Where Dvorak and Price differ are in the simplest yet most striking forms of execution. While Dvorak depends on the explicit reference of African-American folk songs and spirituals, Price is able to take aspects of these genres and incorporate them into the classical symphony without them being cited verbatim. This ability was widely critiqued by the black community at the time because they felt that their music needed to be easily recognizable in order for it to get the attention it deserved. The famed literary critic Alan Locke critiqued Price's work by stating that by not clearly incorporating the exact melodies of African American music, it is neither national nor racial music and dismissively deems it universal music. However, Price, Price's music does incorporate these characteristics that make her music distinguishable from other types. For example, the melody of the first movement uses a pentatonic scale, which is frequently used in African-American music. Next slide. Aspects of Price's award-winning symphony are also uniquely hers. In her 1932 Symphony in E Minor, Florence Price seamlessly blended several characteristics of African-American musical heritage with European musical tradition. This marriage ultimately gained Price recognition at the Chicago World's Fair in the same year. African-American composers <clears throat> of Price's generation closely identified with folk music of their past and use it in their works to tell the story of the black experience and their history. Because of the neo-romantic nationalist movement going on at this time, it was easiest for black composers to accomplish their goal of elevating African-American folk idioms into symphonic forms. The first and most obvious presentation of these African-American folk idioms in Symphony in E minor is the title of the thir third movement itself, Juba Dance. A Juba Dance is defined as a rhythmic technique involving striking the hands on various parts of the body while tapping the feet and singing, which detail a propensity for rhythmic complexity. The rhythmic motif of this dance can be felt throughout the piece, most predominantly in the first and second violin part. Next slide. This eight bar phrase evokes the traditional medium of the Juba dance by creating a crisp yet simple rhythmic melody similar to how it would sound when being tapped on the body. The downbeats being played on beats one and three from the timpani, viola, and cello are also reminiscent of foot tapping. Next slide. These deceptively simple musical structures are inherently bound to the folk tradition in which they are rooted. Cakewalk rhythms are another characteristic at the forefront of movement three. The cakewalk dance started as an appropriation of the white ballroom dances done at parties hosted by white slave owners. The dance was named the cakewalk because though it was meant to mock white slave owners, <clears throat> they took part in encouraging these dances by giving a cake to the best dancing couple. These dances were similar to waltzes and the music that accompanied had distinct Afro-American rhythms and syncopation. Price incorporated cakewalk rhythms into the melody by using syncopated rhythms that emphasize the upbeats. Next slide. The ties used within the cakewalk rhythms uh, create the upbeat emphasis, which would evoke the dancer to the high-legged walk that accompanies the music. If time truly heals all wounds, then the resurgence of Florence B. Price's music is the beginning of the healing process. In 2009, an abandoned house in the woods of Illinois was found littered with music. Among these scattered sheets were the manuscripts of Price's works, along with letters and diary fragments. After this discovery, music scholars all across Arkansas 
came to help recover and maintain the music found. Since then, her manuscripts have been reconstructed and performed so that the music can live on. Though her music was once lost, it is now alive and thriving in the hearts of all who believe in the equalizing power of music. Music is a medium that knows no physical color or face. And so, despite racial tensions, Florence Price courageously paved way for musicians of color by her ability to seamlessly blend African-American idioms with European traditions, thus creating a voice for a new generation of music. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful paper, Jessica. I do want to note that our second presenter today, Samantha Pavelic, is unable to be with us this morning, afternoon. Uh, so I will be reading her paper. Uh, so please forgive me for any stumbles. Also, after the reading of this paper, if you have any questions, uh, there will be time for a very short discussion. You can enter those in on the YouTube chat. All right, so Samantha Pavelic is in her fourth year at the University of the Incarnate Word. She is pursuing her degree in music education with a double minor in all level education and music history. Samantha has always had a love for jazz music and joined the Cardinal Jazz Band in her first year at UIW. She was open to the totally different world of ensemble rehearsal and musical culture that inspired her essay. She worked on this project with Dr. Michelle Eichley in her Women in Music course and had a blast meeting some of the top scholars for women in jazz education via Zoom. Samantha hopes to become a band director and clinician to share the positive experiences music education can bring. Samantha's paper is titled, Women Instrumentalists in Jazz Music Education. <coughs> I attended an instrumental seminar panel the fall semester of 2020 on diversity and inclusion in music, filled with three panelists that would be providing their personal history experiencing racism and gender discrimination. One of the panelists was a professional musician who was there to speak on gender discrimination as a female in music. One of her biggest wishes was for people to refer to her as a professional musician rather than as a woman in music because the word woman, in her opinion, tended to drop the expectations for her career performance and talent. As a jazz instrumental musician, she noted that the majority of her workplace was male dominated. She said that she never really felt lesser than and had never experienced discrimination in her profession. She did not know why there were not more women jazz instrumentalists. My immediate reaction to the discussion was that maybe it is because women are more commonly jazz vocalists. As I reflected on my own answer, I developed a hypothesis to find there was more to the story. I set off to answer, why do we not see or hear about women instrumentalists in the jazz setting? As I began this research, I came across a theme in the school curriculum, performance field, and academia itself. This theme relates to inaccessibility. As a saxophonist from a high school program with no jazz program, I have felt that my existence in the music world was much of an oxymoron. In my interviews, I explained that I felt as though I was an outcast in the grand scheme of things because of the strong associations of saxophone and the jazz genre. Reflecting on my high school's curriculum, both in general education and music settings, I noticed that unless a teacher had some connection with jazz music, it wouldn't be discussed. Even in a historical context, the discussion in high school never went beyond the most Googleable facts for the different time periods and trends covered in my courses, and definitely never circled back to anything my music history courses would offer. Before joining my university's jazz ensemble, I had little to no education of jazz beyond my own personal listening preferences, and many of my jazz performance opportunities have come from this ensemble. Somehow, I still feel as though I've learned nothing at all. 
When meeting virtually with Sherry Tucker, jazz educator and scholar at the University of Kansas, I asked her about her thoughts on this subject and experience in her musical studies. One of the first things we talked about was gender bias in instrumentation, and she shared her story about picking her first instrument, the flute, in the fourth grade. She says, quote, this was one of my first experiences of feeling gender in the world, feeling like I could only pick flute or clarinet, end quote. She explained how the flute and the clarinet were the most female dominant options in her decision and had since reflected on this experience knowing that her dad was an accomplished clarinetist. Her upbringing in music was influenced by, quote, Benny Goodman and all of those records of men playing clarinet and leading bands, end quote. And Tucker has actively asked herself the question, why did I think it was a girl's instrument? Gendered instrumentation is something I have also reflected on as a future music educator and student, especially in my Women in Music course. Some of the first accounts of gendering instruments is from Baldassare Castiglione's The Book of the Courtier. Women were expected to follow what we consider now to be a gender norm for domestic life, caring for the men and children in the home. Many were educated in music in the courtly life, but usually stayed within the home for performance opportunities. Women of the Renaissance were to, quote, sing or choose her instrument in accordance with the ideal of feminine gracefulness, end quote, thus rendering them to play instruments such as the lute and harpsichord. The main issue with women performing instruments such as percussion, brass, or small stringed instruments was the idea of distorting the beauty and, quote, destroying the sweet gentleness, end quote, of a woman, particularly her face. This influence led to a stereotype that we find today leading young musicians to choose instruments based on social norms rather than what they would actually enjoy pursuing. It was a fascinating scenario as Tucker explained her experience with the gender norms, even while having a male in the house playing a feminine instrument. In the educational context, students are not taught instruments by gender, but by families. The four main instrument families spoken about in a general elementary setting would be brass, woodwind, stringed instruments, and percussion where piano is grouped. Characteristics of each could have influenced the way we see instruments today. In Abels' article, he notes the physical properties of the instruments that could hinder a female from playing a masculine associated instrument, such as the tuba, because of its size. In my undergrad experience, I have also learned that some instruments may not be accessible to my future students, male or female, because of their body size, lung capacity, current strength, or physical hindrance. Students can begin learning an instrument in the public school system as early as fourth grade, but the common starting year would be sixth grade. As the students' bodies are still growing and developing through junior high, some may grow quite tall, enabling them to play the trombone much easier in their, later in their years than at 12. However, directors have to make a judgment call based on a variety of factors like the instrumentation needed for the ensemble, how easily students can buzz or make a sound on the mouthpiece, general listening skills, as well as how the instrument fits their physique. Tucker noted that her distaste for the flute was because of a problem with her finger sticking, making the process of practicing a burden. She reflected that one of her favorite instruments, if not her favorite, is the trombone, and that she had gone down this route in fourth grade. Quote, her finger wouldn't have been a problem on the trombone, end quote. I interviewed Katherine Lawson, who is currently pursuing a PhD in American history and has a master's in musicology, about her experience as a jazz trumpet player. Lawson reflected on her trumpet experience through school and explained that although accomplished and driven, her high range suffered because she was scrawny, especially compared to the big guys next to her. Like Tucker, Lawson also started band in the fourth grade and noted that when choosing her instrument, her dad was very excited to hear her make a buzz on the trumpet mouthpiece because he played the tuba. Her mother played what could be considered the feminine counterpart, the flute. She reflected that she always understood that she was entering a masculine area, a, arena of music because of this experience in her household, but explained that her brother was a clarinetist, which swapped their traditional gender roles. 
Some students starting out in their first ensembles tend to follow their peers, especially in relation to education psychologist Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. In the adolescent stage of his theory, students are searching to build some sense of identity for themselves, establishing the roles they will fill in the adult world. Bailey writes, quote, peer influence on instrument selection is a significant force in the lives of adolescents, end quote. And these experiences are met with a sense of security when seeing a familiar face and a sense of apprenticeship under the wing of an older peer. If students are choosing instruments based on these gender roles, we will see a trend in more girls choosing woodwinds and more boys choosing brass. This was not the case for Rachel Frazier, jazz musician and recent graduate of Wellesley College and currently pursuing a PhD in neuroscience at Columbia University, as she reflected on a different experience. Frazier remembered seeing a video in the fifth grade on the different instruments that students could choose from and wanting to play the weird, twisty thing, the French horn. She explained that she wanted to be different and play something that she was interested in. This experience helped her stick with it because she did not feel forced into choosing her instrument. This, in turn, reconnects to the idea of inaccessibility for female musicians, especially in their formative musical years. When students are influenced by these gendered norms for instruments, female musicians lean towards those that are not prevalent in the jazz ensemble, such as flute and clarinet, leaving other instruments to be played primarily by male musicians. Frazier explained that her experience with jazz band was slim until she joined the ensembles at Wellesley. She noted that she participated in a jazz band for one semester in junior high, but that there were limited parts for her because of her instrument being in a different key. Because of this, she never improvised. McKeege's research suggests that, quote, women found it difficult to continue in jazz when their major instrument was not a traditional jazz instrument, end quote. Based on my jazz band experience, there is no need for individual clarinet or flute performers since jazz repertoire rarely features these instruments unless in a big band setting. When featuring these instruments at my university, this role is pro pro primarily taken on by the lead alto. Doubling on instruments allows venues to pay only one musician instead of three or four of the individual woodwind instruments. Noah Veach, Vendoran, Artist, clinician, explains in an interview that there is a disconnect between students doubling instruments because, quote, most don't have the time to practice multiple instruments consistently and that the cost of the instruments is also a deterrent, end quote. Accessibility goes beyond the classroom, as some students capable and willing to play larger brass and woodwind instruments do not have the transportation to take them home for practice. We find this happening more in socioeconomically deficient areas where students are heavily reliant on bus transportation. This not only limits the ability to transport their instrument home, but bus routes often leave immediately at the last bell, preventing students from practicing in the band hall after hours. Like Veach, Frazier noted that there are many barriers, particularly for people of color, to participate in extracurricular activities like jazz and music because of how much time is needed for practice outside of the classroom. Students from low-income communities and households are often responsible for working to support their families. This trend excludes people of color from academia and jazz, leading to a white dominant field of music whose origins are African-American. She mentioned that the jazz curriculum does not connect with the traditional jazz pedagogy since it has been developed by non-black musicians who, quote, have co-opted, dissected, and learned to teach it, making it very far removed from its roots, end quote. Frazier touches on the traditionally communal teachings of jazz and how meticulous the curriculum for jazz is today. Yoko Suzuki, self-taught jazz saxophonist and professor at the University of Pittsburgh, explains that at her university's jazz program, they have trouble recruiting African-American students because universities are expensive, preventing students of color to enroll in the programs and schools. When talking with Tucker, I stated that when inexperienced musicians do not, quote, get something right away, they are not willing to pursue it regarding improvisation. She responded that there is a lot of shaming in jazz education, adding a quote that she has heard from women 
who have quit jazz because, quote, if a guy made a mistake, it's like he's having an off day. But if a woman makes a mistake, it's because she can't play, end quote. I explained that at my university, there is a jazz combo that is for students, where one of the men from the jazz ensemble wrote a piece to support students wanting to take improvisation solos. The composer wrote the piece, It's All Good, with a cheat sheet for the lead sim sheet symbols that students would not only be able to understand, but could look at to pick notes from. I've not taken a solo in the main jazz ensemble because the repertoire is so challenging to the eye. My limited jazz education has not prepared me for improvisation, but with a support and explanation like this, I may feel more prepared to take a risk, something that Suzuki spoke about in her interview. When explaining this to Frazier, she stated, exposure limits a woman's access to jazz at the university level. End quote. Because women who do not have as much access beforehand, who do not come from prominent jazz programs, or are discouraged from performing jazz, might not have the chops to perform jazz at the university level. Women may find it more difficult, get cut, or scrutinized because improvisation is not something that is easily picked up. The jazz performance space is not accessible to women, both mentally and physically. Tucker explained that as a woman, there are, quote, safety differences, not just in jazz, but across all performing art venues, end quote. Especially as performances tend to take place in large populated cities, Frazier reflected on this scenario where the night culture, drinking culture, and male-dominated venues, primarily being bars, makes the gigging life terrifying for women. She explains that the fear women experience traveling at night limits a musician's ability Availability stating, quote, if you're at a gig and you can't stay at the gig because you have to get home before dark, that sucks, end quote. As you lose the chance to perform as well as the opportunity to network with other musicians. Another thought mentioned was the idea of interacting with men in these places where women may be unfamiliar. She explains, the second you're off this stage, someone will ask to buy you a drink and if you say no, you will have to worry about if they are following you home. All these factors create a barrier for women to become professional jazz musicians, and she notes that it's something that men don't even think about. In my university's ensemble, I am one of few student members. Out of this handful, I am the only girl. Many of the members are professional musicians with experiences performing with each other as well as with some of the greatest jazz musicians in history. The camaraderie among the members matches that of the conversation and experiences I share with my peers in the wind ensemble or my music courses. I have observed the conversations between members of the ensemble and how much of the discussion is centered on their past performances together. In my time playing with the members, I noticed how the discussions held by the members sometimes revolved around women and the old world norms of objectification, usually in reference to a pop tune we would be rehearsing, such as Along Came Polly. As a female, there was not really a moment that I would be interested in this discussion, nor any opportunity for me to speak on anything else. It was always interesting to see eyes shoot across the room after remembering that I was there and how the conversation would progress or halt. I asked interview participants if this locker room lingo or behavior was common in the jazz scene or just among pals working in an ensemble. Tucker explained that female jazz trumpetists she has interviewed have told her that <clears throat> the language used by band directors two trumpet players is always really phallic, such as balls to the wall, and that these directors speak without any consciousness of what they are saying or who they are addressing. Suzuki noted that even with this kind of terminology, she felt respected by ensemble members she worked with because of the nature of her educational experience learning jazz in Japan. Lawson explained that as a high school section leader with her peers, she used similar, similar terminology that could be offensive or not safe for work, even though she was a woman. She reflected on her relationship with her peers and how she, quote, always had a really clear sense of knowing her place. High school was positive, and she explained that she felt comfortable and safe among the adult men because there was a clear level of respect between the students and the adults. 
Lawson connected this with the adults either being music educators or having children her age, which could have prevented them from trying anything or seeing her in a sexualized way. When talking about her experiences and comfort in the ensemble, I was reminded of the revolving second alto position, which had held multiple musicians in its spot since joining my freshman year. I prefaced explaining that the saxophone members in the ensemble do not speak to me outside of general greetings or goodbyes. However, I noticed that male student members are spoken to by their section mates. This situation changed when a new member joined the ensemble and took an interest in speaking to me. I was surprised at first because of the trend with the other members, but my intuition sent out red flags as this member wanted to spend more and more time talking to me. He wanted to play with me and another female member that he had not yet met. And I avoided this situation by stating my lesson teacher was required to be at our rehearsals and asked another male student in the saxophone studio to join us as well. Fortunately, I spoke up about my concerns and the member was replaced by a new member who I mentioned was supporting students in improvisation earlier in this paper. I will never know where the situation may have evolved, but brought it up as a topic of male, but brought it up a topic of male mentorship provided to female jazz musicians. I talked about this with Suzuki as she explained that male mentorship is difficult to navigate as a woman because it could inherently turn sexual because of heterosexual norms. She explained that she had experience forming a relationship with a male mentor she worked with and that it happens to women a lot. This makes it hard for women to find good male mentors, but that over the years there have been more female instrumentalists able to mentor other female musicians. She noted that in her research more than 10 years ago, quote, more than 10 years ago, the woman she interviewed did not see probably any female saxophone players as role models, uh, end quote. But younger instrumentalists like Alexa Tarantino have spoken about inspiration from Erica von Kleist, jazz saxophonist and private lesson teacher for over 15 years. Suzuki explained that in her past interviews, the female saxophone role models accessible to them were slim leaving musicians to look to Ingrid Jensen, jazz trumpetist, or Terry Lynn Carrington, jazz drummer and founder of the recently added Jazz and Gender Justice Program at Berklee College of Music. Known saxophonist of the time, V. Red, did not play in a modern style, leaving musicians to look up to saxophonists such as Chris Potter and Michael Brecker, who played in a more advanced style. Suzuki noted that the increase of women jazz instrumentalists has changed very quickly, and we believe that this will influence more female students to play jazz. Tucker stated that, quote, just to see someone can really make an impact, end quote. After reflecting on a female role model she had learned from in the past, she explained that Dee Spencer, professor of jazz and musical theater at San Francisco State University is a prominent role model that she met later in life, but loved the way she taught jazz. Tucker explained that the way she taught about improvisation was not about cutting each other down and the discussions of performance were healthy. I told her that I do not have a female role model for jazz, but that the first female jazz musician I sat by was a baritone saxophonist who subbed for one of my university's jazz concerts. I remembered a natural magnetism to speak to her because she was a woman, and I felt more connected to the music than ever before, knowing that there was someone who looked like me in this space. Unfortunately, I could not remember her name because the nature of the concert was quick in passing, but the experience continues to encourage me to stay plain in the space. I asked participants if they learned about women in jazz in their high school or college experiences. I expected Lawson to have learned more about women in jazz than enter interviewees based on the prominence of the jazz ensemble at her high school. To my surprise, she said that women were not a prominent part of her school's music curriculum. This brought up the concept of biases in academia and checking the sources of the information because jazz is and has been a black art form but the sources are reproduced by people who are not thinking like we are thinking. In general music history textbooks, there is a disconnect between the women discussed and them becoming standards. 
I explained that in a class discussion with Dr. Marion Wilson Kimber, 19th century music scholar and professor at the University of Iowa, we talked about how women are switched out of the textbooks as, a new, as each new edition is made, making it difficult to view women in music as standards or the greats. Frazier reflected that in her music history classes. She learned very little about women in music history and that texts written by men weren't great descriptions, focusing on, quote, a woman's family life, who they were married to, their temper, or what they may have been addicted to, end quote. She also notes that those ja women in jazz who are included are often vocalists or pianists. Tucker had a similar experience that without a research opportunity in her women's studies class, she did not experience learning about women in jazz in the classroom. Further stating, I don't think I would have been encouraged to write about women in jazz in a jazz class, even if I had thought about it. There is room for jazz education to evolve. Based on my experience, the lack of jazz education correlated with the amount of jazz knowledge of the educators before me. My high school band directors were male, brass instrumentalists, and were heavily involved in classical literature as well as German polka band because of the community, community in my high school was based in. Had there been more education in their own musical education, my time in high school may have been more enriched with music history beyond John Philip Sousa. Lawson explained that the universities can really impact the high schools near them, and she specifies that Texas has a great music education programs, specifically jazz at the University of North Texas, but that those schools without a campus nearby may not have a heavy jazz influence. Tucker is taking the steps to promote jazz in her university setting through her class, Jazz in American Culture, where she teaches it entirely through women musicians. She stated that she, quote, could change the title to women in jazz, but she labor, el later elaborated that she feels like she's doing more feminist work by just calling it jazz. Uh, the name of the class is her way of challenging students who may join with a preconceived idea of what they already know about jazz to broaden their horizons. Jazz and gender are extremely intersectional because of the rich history behind the genre. While evolving, women Women continue to experience careers in jazz that are met with misogyny, discrimination, and frustration from always needing to prove they belong. It's taking steps by promoting jazz education in a neutral format and supporting diversity and mu musicianship interchangeably can help promote jazz to a wider audience than middle to high class white males. Until jazz is liberated from its historical biases, we will continue to see a disparity between African-American students and women being liberated musically by what jazz can offer. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. All right, Jessica, will you join me up here? Um, so please, if you have any questions, um, either for, Jessica or Samantha, I will forward Samantha the questions and, and, send, uh, and she can email and, and respond and answer those questions as well. But does anybody have any questions for Jessica? I'll go ahead and get started. What inspired you to write an analysis paper on Florence Price's first symphony? Yeah, so um, last spring, oh, sorry. Last spring, um, I took a class called uh, Women of Color in Music with Dr. Guerrero, and we spent like that entire class just learning about different women composers um, from different countries, and the one that I really enjoyed learning about was Florence Price because she was American um, and African American specifically. Um, and it was so interesting to me that she was basically forgotten um, and that all of a sudden someone ran into a cabin in the woods and had just happened to find a bunch of music and it happened to be her. So I thought that was like very interesting um, how all of her stuff began to resurface. And so um, then I took my history of Western class with Dr. Janicek and I, uh, I was taking those classes at the same time and we were tasked with um, a project to write about um, an aspect of music or a composer that we wanted to learn about and I instantly thought about Florence Price and Symphony in E minor and just learning about what her life was like and how she came to be a composer and yeah all that good stuff. Great. Yeah. Awesome 
Yeah, so um, something I've thought a lot about since learning about her and specifically other female composers is trying to incorporate their works into whatever program I end up teaching at. Um, I can guarantee I've never played anything by um, a woman composer, especially when I was in middle school or high school. Um, so I think that would be really cool to bring in her, uh, try to bring in works that have been transposed for those grade levels and stuff like that. I think that'd be really cool. <laughs> and that's a great connection to the other paper as well as mm -hmm. what we experience as students will yeah. influence our later teaching. Absolutely. And so like, you've learned about Florence Price, mm -hmm. you're gonna incorporate more women composers mm -hmm. as a teacher, mm -hmm. and the same goes for jazz instrumentalists. Yes, yeah, definitely. All right, are there any other questions? All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you all so much for joining us. We will return at three o'clock for our concert. Thank you.